welcome to this week's edition of our Zoom into Archaeology program. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, as most of you probably know, this has been the Florida Public Archaeology Network's answer to doing public outreach and education in the time of social distancing. And so we're super grateful to have lots of amazing speakers and topics um, to keep people engaged with local archaeology. This week we are welcoming Mike Toman, who is the Florida Public Archaeology Network Museum Manager. He's going to talk to us about the use of drones in archaeology. So I'm really excited about this one. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things before we go ahead and get started. Um, if you would go ahead and mute your audio, um, that would be super helpful. It just cuts down on background noise for all of us, um, just in case uh, the dog barks in the background or something drives by really loud. So that would be really helpful. Um, this presentation is going to be recorded. So again, if you don't want your face appearing in the recording and your video is on, go ahead and turn your video off too. If you have questions for Mike during the presentation, um, if you could use the chat function, that seems to work pretty well. Go ahead and type your question in the chat box. And then at the very end of Mike's presentation, we'll go ahead and uh, give him an opportunity to answer any questions you might have. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and turn my audio off and turn my video off and I'm gonna let Mike take over. So thanks, Mike. Yeah, great, thanks, Nicole. Can everybody hear me okay? If you can't, just type in. I see Gary saying yes, good. So I'll assume everybody can. So what? All right, Courtney says yes. Uh, well, uh, it's good to be here. I wish we could do this in person, but you know, this is how it is right now. So what I'm going to go ahead and do right now is uh, share my screen with everybody, and hopefully you all can see it. If you can't see it, please let me know. And share. Okay, so you should be seeing my my presentation. Uh, if you guys don't see my presentation, just please let me know in the chat. I'll give it a couple seconds. I'm assuming you guys can see it. All right, so let's get started. Um, so of course, uh, as you all probably know, um, uh, we were part of the Florida Public Archaeology Network. So we are actually a statewide program at the University of West Florida. And so I work out of our coordinating center uh, here in downtown Pensacola, which is where I'm uh, taking this video out of right now. Um, but we do all sorts of types of public educational programming for uh, promoting archaeology around the entire state. Uh, so we have a website, fpan.us, uh, so please check that out and keep up to date on all the fun stuff that we're still doing, even though most of it's vir virtual right now. And so today, uh, this talk is called, It's a Bird, It's a Plane, It's a UAV. Uh, and so this is uh, laying out uh, some different ways that archaeologists are starting to use drones or unmanned aerial vehicles, which is what UAV stands for, within the field of archaeology. And so uh, what we're going to do is kind of highlight a couple different sites where it's been used at and some different sorts of things that archaeologists are using drones for. Uh, I will go over a little bit in terms of um, what you're supposed to be flying, how you're supposed to be flying a drone, but really like if you have any uh, questions in terms of, you know, you want to go out and purchase a drone and then fly it on your own. Uh, I, I would recommend going to the uh, Federal Aviation Administration's website, FAA.org, and I have a link for that that will give you way more information that I, than I will ever learn about the use of UAVs uh, just in general, whether you're going to use them commercially or recreationally. So we will cover a little bit of that. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions in, in terms of that, but really the, the focus of this is really just some examples of use in archaeology. So, um, so like I said, drones have been used in archaeology for a number of years now, uh, but they're, they're something that over the last couple years in particular, you've seen them used a lot more heavily. And then we're seeing drones mainly used in archaeology and things for what we call remote sensing. And remote sensing is just investigating uh, a site um, without actually impacting it. Um, and so this is just another way to do that. Um, it's also used a lot in preservation as well as interpretation of archeological sites. So uh, we'll go over a couple of things though quickly. First, Archaeology 101, uh, which we'll talk very briefly about what archeology span is and what it is not. Then we'll talk about, like I mentioned uh, briefly just a minute ago, of some basic uses of drone, what you should do, what you should not do. And then how it's part of, really now it's part of a, the archeologist growing toolkit in the 21st century. So first, let's start with what is archaeology. Um, simply put, 
archaeology is the study of past people based on what they left behind. Uh, so it's, it's actually a, a sub-discipline of the field of anthropology. Uh, and so really what we're looking at is things that were made or used by human beings, and we call these artifacts. Archaeologists are also looking at things like uh, structures, uh, even what we call features, and these, are, these can be things that are buried underground, whether it's like the brick foundation of a building, or it could be the uh, remains of a uh, you know, fire pit. So all those things are part of archaeology. So archaeology is not the study of rocks. It's not the study of dinosaurs, and it's not Indiana Jones. So archaeologists aren't looking for very valuable things that they can sell to a museum or sell on eBay. That's a big no-no in archaeology. Archaeologists are, are really anthropologists, and so they're interested in questions regarding uh, humanity and, human, and, hum, and the human past. And drones are just another tool for us to understand that. And so uh, when I say drone, what do we mean? Well, a drone is simply just uh, an unmanned aerial vehicle. So it's, it's a, a vehicle that can fly in the air that doesn't have a pilot inside of it. It's piloted remotely uh, with, with a con controller. And so uh, drones can come in a lot of different sizes. Of course, uh, probably the, one of the most familiar ones to most people is the Predator. This is the MQ-1 Predator drone. Uh, costs over $4 million. It's very large, 27 feet long, 48 foot wingspan. So very large, very expensive. Uh, but over the years, drones have come down uh, in size and come way down in price, and they've been used for more recreational or commercial purposes, even though they were initially developed for military purposes. And so this is an example of a small drone. Uh, this is the DJI, which is a company that makes a lot of different drones, including the one, one of the uh, the one that we have at FPAN. This is the Mavic Air. As you can see, it fits in this person's hand, so it's very small, and it's uh, you know under under eight hundred dollars, so it coming way down in price. Um, so there's a lot of uses for drone. Again, a lot of people use it for recreational purposes. Uh, it's also used in commercial situations, including archaeology. If it's a cultural resource management firm, they're starting to use a little bit more. But regardless of whether you fly drones strictly for fun or fly it for you know, whatever business you might own, uh, there are certain rules, basic rules that you have to follow. Uh, so it's just a quick, quick few things. So all drones are required to be registered with the FAA and marked on the outside with their registration number. Um, you, uh, are, you're actually limited on the altitude. It's fly 400 feet or below. You cannot go over 400 feet without getting like special permissions to do that with the FAA, which is not easy. You're supposed to always keep a visual line of sight of the drone. So uh, the drone that we have, the Mavic uh, Pro, um, it, it's got a, a distance of eight kilometers. But of course, like if I flew it eight kilometers away, I wouldn't be able to see it. So you're actually required to be able to physically see it while it's in the air. And then I know your airspace. Make sure you're not flying in any areas that are restricted. Um, there's also a lot of things that you should not do, like fly over large groups. Uh, you should never fly under the influence. Uh, you should never fly near emergency operations or near restricted airspace. So if the military's, you know, along the military base, or if there was just a hurricane that came through and the FAA and FEMA has decla declared a national emergency, uh, you're not allowed to fly during that either. So there's a ton of other rules. It's constantly changing. So it's something you have to keep up with if you do get involved in flying drones. Um, and they, like I said, there's, there's tons of other rules there that I won't go over. But the best thing you can do is go to that link that I just put up there is faa.gov backslash UAS backslash. And that will give you all sorts of information about registering a drone and the rules you're supposed to follow. Uh, and so that, again, these apply regardless of whether you're doing it for research or commercial purposes or recreation. Okay, but drones really are just becoming part of the toolkit of 21st century, 21st century archaeologists. So just like GPS, global positioning system, um, archaeologists use that all the time. We use that all the time in our every, everyday lives. Uh, GPR, which most people are probably familiar with what that is. It stands for ground penetrating radar. That's uh, pretty typically used on archaeological site sites now and basically this is a device that's able to uh, send radar signals into the ground. It bounces off of stuff that's buried underneath, and then it can give you an idea of, of a, a ground disturbance in the ground, basically is what it does. And, and PXRF uh, is another tool that's used in archaeology that's, that's allowing archaeologists to do things like figure out exactly where pieces of stone or pieces of pottery may have been sourced from. And so 
just like all those other tools that archaeologists have adopted um, from other sciences, drones are just another one of them. Okay, so we're gonna cover a couple different uh, sites and, and some examples of what they're using these drones for uh, in terms of mapping and survey, uh, photogrammetry, and what we call LIDAR. And I'll explain what those all are as we get into them. So first starting with uh, uh, mapping and survey. Um, it's important to know again that this is all part of remote sensing. So it's, it's, it's not disturbing a site, it's being able to investigate sites without actually impacting anything. Uh, and so GPS, GPR, uh, side scan sonar, magnetometers, those are all considered remote sensing devices and drones are just another one of them. But our ideas of drones have obviously changed a lot over time. Probably, of course, drones have been a, around for quite a long time. Uh, really, drones as we know them today have been around since a little bit before World War II. Um, but most people, up until probably the last five to 10 years, when they think of drones, have thought of them as being used for military purposes. Uh, really, drones didn't come part of the kind of public consciousness until probably the, the uh, war on terror in 2001. And that's where you start seeing these cartoons with, you know, drone predators with missiles on them. And now, of course, uh, people see drones as impacting the shipping industry, like in this uh, little cartoon right here. So um, people have always kind of been wary of new technology and drones are no different, uh, but it's something that is probably gonna become more regularly part of everybody's daily lives. Uh, of course, it's good to have some concern about that. Um, we always need to ask questions and make sure we're doing the right thing. But again, this is just another technology that is allowing us to do really cool things with, although there's some kind of scary sides to it too. So first, in terms of mapping and survey, we're gonna look at a couple different examples of that. And first, we're gonna to turn to uh, St. Augustine, Florida, America's second oldest settlement with Pensacola being first. I like to always point that out. Uh, but this site that you see on the screen is called Nombre de Dios. It's uh, right outside the city of St. Augustine. It was uh, right after St. Augustine was founded by the Spanish in 1565. Uh, within the first decade or so, they built one of the first missions uh, at, at this site, Nombre de Dios. And a few years ago, archeologists with the University of Florida uh, started doing some excavations out there and they, they uncovered uh, the these foundational remains, um, what you're seeing uh, that's been exposed in this drone shot is actually the footings or the foundations of a building that was constructed probably in 1702. That was probably a hermitage. Uh, it was part of this, um, that, this church that was destroyed. The church was destroyed in 1702 and they, so they built onto it later on. And this is probably what this is of. But drones are great because uh, they can get shots like this. So um, in archeology, span when they do excavations, they have to always document sites. So it's really important that as they're doing excavations, they're constantly taking photographs of what they're excavating. Um, and that way, once the site's excavated, uh, they can go back and look and see um, you know, what, what they found. And there's a document of that. And also once you excavate a site, you can never put it back exactly as they initially found it. So it's really important to have a record of that. Um, but in archeology, span a lot of times you'll, you'll go to a site and you'll see archeologists, you know, three or four archeologists kind of struggling with a really tall ladder to get the perfect shot of a site, uh, which can take a lot of, a lot of, a lot of practice and a lot of time. Whereas drones, you could do it very quickly. I mean, you could do it in less than a minute, get all the shots you need with a drone. And then they can take the, the shots they get from a drone and then create really, really uh, wonderful maps of the site. And so that's just one way that drones have really helped out in terms of uh, using them in the field uh, where you can use them really in, in, in any situation in archeology span where you're excavating sites and you need to document features. Uh, this is another way that drones have been used. So other than just documenting the site and mapping it, um, we can actually look at the destruction of sites. And so this, is, uh, this site is actually a, was originally a Kurdish castle in Syria that was constructed in the 11th century. Um, and then later on, the uh, Christian crusaders actually took it over and it became a crusader castle. Uh, so oftentimes this is called like a, a crusader castle, even though it was initially Kurdish. But in, uh, on the left, you're seeing an image of this particular castle taken from a military drone in the year 2008 by the U.S. Department of State. And then, um, of course, there was, a, a, there was a civil war and it's still ongoing in Syria. Um, and then uh, in 2014, ISIS, which was a terrorist organization, took over um, 
large portions of the Middle East, Syria in particular, and they went around and destroyed a lot of the cultural resources there, including this particular castle. Well, the U.S. State Department was able to take a drone and find out exactly where some of the damage had occurred on this particular site. Uh, so they could get a good assessment of the damage that needed to be addressed at some later point in time. And these arrows that you're seeing on the castles, you can actually see they're, they're blown out because this had been a, a mortars that had actually been fired on this particular site. So just documenting and knowing um, what sort of damage is happening at site uh, can be really helpful in terms of trying to go back and preserve them later on. And this wouldn't have been possible without this drone shot. Um, but in the same way, so you know, that's obviously human-made destruction, uh, but drones can also be used to help document sites that are disturbed or uncovered or damaged by nature. And so these two photographs are an example of that. So uh, these are actually both in, in, on the left is a photograph taken right after Hurricane Michael. So it was a few days after Hurricane Michael hit. This is on Dog Island, which, which, is, um, which is in the Florida Panhandle near Apalachicola. And the only way to get to Dog Island, there's no, there's no bridge to it. You have to go by boat or I guess fly a drone. But there were a number of shipwrecks uh, that sank on Dog Island in the 1890s. Uh, and after Hurricane Michael hit, it actually uncovered a number of these shipwrecks. And now uh, what was great about having drones is that this individual was able to fly over it and document these sites uh, without actually having to disturb them or, or, or go to the sites. Uh, so documenting shipwrecks is one thing you can do with drone. Uh, the photo on the right is, 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 was uh, taken on Dolphin Island, which is in Alabama. Uh, we, we went up late last year or earlier this year. I can't even remember when it was anymore. Uh, but this, uh, this particular wreck was uncovered. And so we were able to take our drone out and get some really good shots of it to document it. And we believe that's probably an, uh, probably an early 20th century oyster boat based on its size, size and shape. Um, so again, having, and then if you visited the site without the drone, it would have been really difficult to make a good clear map and get a good shot of, of this wreck before it got covered back up. But we were able to do that really quickly. So that's for mapping and survey. Next, we're gonna move on to a couple of examples of using drones for what's called photogrammetry. So photogrammetry has been around for, for a little while, but it's becoming more and more popularly used in uh, the field of archeology span and historic preservation. And basically photogrammetry is taking photographs, taking lots of different photographs of an object uh, from different angles and different heights, and then taking those photos, running them through the computer program. And then the computer program is basically able to take those images and create a 3D model of the, of the, the object just based on those photos. Um, and so you can do this basically with any camera, as long as you have the, the right software, you can pretty much do it. Um, but you're starting to see this being used in drones as well. And so, uh, and so instead of taking you know, a handheld camera, you're taking the camera that's used on a, that's already attached to a drone or one that you can attach to a drone. And instead of taking a picture of just one object to make a 3D model, they can take pictures of entire landscapes and make 3D models out of that by using just a camera on the drone. And so that's kind of giving you an idea of, of what the drone is doing here in this image. This is uh, showing you how the software works for photogrammetry. So this is obviously a headstone at a cemetery, um, but the little, the, the blue squares or rectangles that you see over the, the, the this, this grave marker is actually the position of where the camera was taken from. And so you see that the, the pictures were taken from different angles, and then they can take those images and run them through this particular software, and it's created, this, this is a 3D model of, of those images. So really cool stuff you can do that. So um, they've actually done that with some archeological sites and they've had some pretty good success with it. So we'll look at a couple of those. Uh, the first that we're gonna look at is a site in Ecuador uh, at one of the national parks there. Uh, this is a pre-Inca and Incan period fortress uh, that was built at the foot of an active volcano. And so researchers with the Aerial Digital Archeology span and Preservation Program were able to fly their drones over this entire site taking pictures from different angles and different altitudes, and then running that through that photogrammetry software, and they got this 3D model. And this is great because we now have a record, a permanent record, a digital permanent record of the site, which is a fairly large landscape you're not only seeing the, the walls of some of the fortresses, but you can even see some of the trails within the actual model itself. And if, you know, 
if something happens to the site, like if the volcano erupts and destroys the site, we at least have a good document of the site before that ever happens. So you, you're starting to see photogrammetry used on large scale landscapes to document sites. Um, we've tried a little bit of that with our drone. Uh, this is the higher Knowles planning chimney. This is in Pensacola. It's off uh, Scenic Highway, uh, Highway 90, um, off the, one of the Pensacola Bluffs. And it's a Civil War period planning mill that was destroyed during the Civil War. Um, and what's left of it above ground, at, at least, is this chimney that was part of the planning mill. Um, we took our drone out there last year to try to get some shots of it. Uh, we weren't able to get a, get a really good model from the photos, so we're getting better at that now. And a lot of it has to do with the time of day that you go on and how the shadows or how the light hits the, the object you're trying to capture. So um, we're still kind of playing around with that model, but hopefully uh, we'll be able to get uh, a good 3D model of this particular um, ruin. That way, if a hurricane comes and knocks it over or if a tree falls on it or something like that, we'll have a good record, a digital record of what it looked like before that unfortunate event. Hopefully never happens, but you never know. And the last thing we wanted to talk about before I open it up to questions is called uh, LIDAR. And um, LIDAR, as you've probably seen or heard of it before because it has made its way into popular media, whether it's in television shows or movies or uh, magazines or news articles. But LIDAR is a technology that's been around for a little while. Um, and it stands for light detection and ranging. Um, so you've probably seen, if you've heard of it before, it's probably been in relation to some uh, Mayan ruins that they've been able to locate in um, densely forested jungles in like Guatemala. And what's great about this technology is it's basically using lasers that can penetrate through tree canopy. And those lasers will back, bounce back to the sensor and then running it through a computer program can give you billions of different points that that light hit. And then from those points, you can actually build out exact models of um, topographic models of landscapes. And so this is great for identifying archaeological sites that might be hidden underneath very dense vegetation like the jungles of Guatemala. Um, however, more recently, the LIDAR has been utilized just on drones. So it used to be if you wanted to use LIDAR, uh, you know, it was very large equipment that you could only carry on like airplanes, so fixed wing air aircrafts or air helicopters. So it became really expensive to do that. Well, now you can attach them to drones because that technology has come down uh, a lot in size as well as in price. Think of how expensive cell phones used to be, right? And now they're like tiny and they, they don't cost that much. Same kind of idea. But this, uh, the, the, the actual LIDAR on this particular drone is that puck that says yellow scan. Um, you know, when I say that it's, it's come way down in price, it's still not cheap. This particular LIDAR puck costs around $8,000. Uh, and the drone itself costs a couple thousand dollars. So it still can be cost prohibitive, but a lot of universities and research institutes are starting to use this technology uh, specifically for archaeology, but other applications too. And so we'll just look at a couple of different examples of how that's been being used. Uh, and these, these have all been used within the last two years. So this is fairly recent that they're actually using LIDAR on drones opposed to fixed wing aircraft. So one site we're going to look at, this actually is in the uh, this is in Mexico, just south of a river there. And it, it is a, a, you can see from this, the red that, images that you're seeing here, this is the flight path that the drone took. So the drone had to basically fly a flight path up and down with that LIDAR scanning with its lasers all this area so they could see what was hidden beneath uh, the vegetation in this area to, to document these sites. And so this is just showing you the flight path that the drone took. And that's after the imagery has been processed. So it's incredible what they're able to see uh, by using this, this LIDAR technology. Um, you can see, and, and these date from the 7th to 9th century. And so we're seeing things like um, buildings, large monumental stone structures, as well as smaller structures like canals and roads and things like that. And again, this is, this is all just using a drone. Uh, the same thing they've done over, and uh, this is a site in Colorado. This is a Pueblo site that dates from the 1200s to 1300s. It's at a site called Sand Canyon Pueblo at the Canyons of the Ancients, which is a, a national monument out there. And so you can see some of the ruins here 
Um, and these include great houses, kivas, towers, a whole walled community. Um, this particular site has over uh, 420 rooms, 14 towers, 90 kivas. So it's a very large, significant site. Now, while you can see some of the structures um, like in this photo, a lot of them are very difficult to see from the air because of all the vegetation around it. So research were researchers were able to use LIDAR on a drone to capture this. And this is showing you, if you look here on the left, um, where you see those indentations, those are all kivas. And kivas were basically subterranean structures that the Pueblo people would use for religious and ceremonial purposes. If you've ever been out to New Mexico or Colorado, like Mesa Verde is a pretty popular site, then you're familiar with what I'm talking about. But um, it's pretty incredible that this technology is able to uh, basically penetrate all that vegetation um, and all that brush and then see all these features on the landscape, um, including the towers there as well on the right. And the last one we will talk about for LIDAR was, uh, Used, used last year, about one year ago, and it was used in Florida. This is a site called the Rowley Island Shell Complex. It's um, in west central part of Florida. It's near Cedar Key, but it's in a very inaccessible area. And so there are no roads to this area. The only way you can get there is by boat. And of course, from this image, it, you can't really tell that there's anything there because of the vegetation. And this image that you're seeing right now is taken from Google Earth. Uh, so as you can see, it's pretty remote and uh, it's very, very densely uh, vegetated. But the University of Florida was able to use LIDAR mounted to a drone, and they were able to reveal this. And so what you're seeing is the LIDAR data. And so the blue is, is uh, low level, and then the, the, the yellow and the red is higher elevation. And so what they were able to determine was that this was actually the remains of what we call shell rings. And so they were able to see these features and shell rings, they're not exactly sure what they were used for, uh, but we know that native prehistoric native people living in Florida uh, created these shell rings. And now we know that at this particular site, the people who lived at this site were major producers of shell beads that were traded all across North America. I mean, we find these beads, some of the beads that were made in Florida, um, in areas like Illinois, uh, Cahokia. So th these were, this was a major production of shell beads uh, that, that went all over the, were traded with other groups all around North America. Um, but by using data like this, they're able to find these sites that would have been completely hidden under the thick vegetation. And based on this data, they were able to then go in with a boat and investigate these areas uh, pretty quickly. And so they were able to actually do some excavations out there. And that's why they determined that, that this site was a major producer of um, shell beads. And so these are just some examples of, of the use of drones in archaeology. It's a really exciting field. We're probably going to see a lot more of it. Um, and then the other thing that we've really been able to do with drone technology is uh, public education interpretation. So a lot of these images that you're seeing, uh, I can only show to you because of this drone technology. And with that, uh, that's pretty much all I have for the presentation. So I wanted to open it up for questions and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you all might have. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop my um, screen sharing so I can look and see if there's anything in the chat. Awesome, thank you, Mike, for that great presentation. Sure.